Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Victory Loves Company podcast. I'm Conrad Agderian, and today we're going to talk about the very basics of investing with stocks and playing the stock market 101. So in this episode, we'll go into great detail of each of the following. ETFs, asset allocation, passive funds, risk reward, risk attitude, volatility, real estate investment trust, shorting a stock, wash rules, PE ratio, balance sheets, dividends, multi-access funds, the NICI, the 10-year treasury bond, stop losses, stop limits, limit orders, market orders, order executions, Roth IRAs, SEP IRAs, and derivatives. You got all that? Good. Because I don't know what the hell most of them even are. And as a beginner, neither should you. Because today we're going to talk about investing just a little bit amount of money just to wet your beak in the market. What I have found personally is that decoding the investment jargon can help you understand how and where your money is being invested. But it's important to know that you don't get jammed up with all these technical terms because a lot of them, not that they don't apply, but there's no need to know about them right now. So if you're trying to learn a language, you don't need to figure out how to order wedding photography as one of the first sentences. You start off with the basics, the hello, how are you, my name is this, and that's it. If you have a passion and are willing to learn and to improve yourself, then you will learn these terms and apply them to your investment lifestyle over time. But I do not want you to get boggled down with these investment terms because they will only scare the hell out of you as they have with me. This is something that I feel very passionate about as I am a self-taught investor. I really had nobody to hold me by the hand and tell me, well, this is what this means and this is what that means. But I knew I was onto something when my friends and distant uh, relatives started asking me for investment advice. Now, these are people that are older than me, which I was very flattered by. And here I am as a non-seasonal investor, but I have had tremendous success um, in the market. Some of it you can chalk up to just luck, some of it which is just an educated guess, and some of it was just being educated and being informed as to what it is that you are purchasing. So my goal here today is to take any fear or any doubt out of investing with stocks. I'm not gonna touch on bonds because that's not my specialty. And the professional account that I have managed is a completely different animal altogether. So I'm only going to talk to you about investing in stocks, ETFs, and uh, mutual funds, which are like the three basics that you should know when putting a little money into the market. So let's begin. The first thing that you're going to want to do, obviously, is you're going to want to find an online brokerage account or actually, yeah, that's it, just an online brokerage account. There are a bunch to choose from. There's Fidelity, which is what I personally use. There's TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, E-Trade, Merrill Lynch, uh, TradeStation, Scott Trade, and Vanguard. Um, Like I said, I personally use Fidelity because it's very easy to use and I am familiar with their platform. Now, there's nothing wrong with the other ones that I had mentioned, but just like Samsung and Apple, two companies that make cell phones, both cell phones for the most part do the same thing, but it's just a matter of what are you more comfortable with and what have you been using longer. Some people are very devoted to Apple. Some people are devoted to their Samsung Galaxies. So when doing your research, a couple things that you want to look at are, are there any transaction fees and are there any minimums that you have to invest or any kind of maintenance fees? As far as maintenance fees, most of them don't charge them, but transaction fees, most of them do. So for example, if you wanted to buy a stock, it'll usually cost you about between five and seven dollars for the transaction and then when you go to sell it i think it's between five and seven dollars i know fidelity's used to be seven and then they knocked it down to five so every time you purchase something you're already five dollars um in the red but don't let that five dollars scare you because statistically speaking stocks have the ability to improve 
and increase in value over time more so than real estate, than bonds, and even your life. Odds are the company will be still around and still kick in long after you have passed away. So I say again, investing in stocks is a very good way to put your money to work rather than have it sitting around in a checking or a low yield savings account. So let's start with some of the basics. If you're going to be investing in stocks, what is a stock? Simply put, you're buying a little piece of ownership of a company, of a publicly traded company. Disney, Walmart, Apple, AutoZone, Amazon, I'm sure you've heard a lot of these companies. So you're gonna to wanna to find a company that is financially stable. You're gonna to wanna to find a company that is well known. This is also known as a blue chip stock. So companies like Home Depot, um, again, Amazon, Microsoft, ATT, Verizon, Pfizer, these are what is known as blue chip stocks. It's a fancy way of saying that these companies are not gonna go out of business tomorrow. So you can count on them for the most part to still be there when you wake up in the morning. So since these are publicly traded companies, you have the right to purchase shares from them. And depending on how well or not well the company is doing will be contingent on the stock price. So when picking a stock, my suggestion would be to pick a blue chip, blue chip stock. Find a company that is well known, find a company that is not going anywhere. And if you wanna add a little cherry on top, pick a company that you even shop at. So if you're big into uh, Walmart, if you're big into Target, if you shop a lot on Amazon, which is really expensive at the moment, if you buy a lot of Apple products, if you're a Verizon customer, things like that. A lot of the companies I had mentioned trade on what is called the Dow Jones or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow Jones is a uh, compilation of the 30 biggest companies operating in the United States. There is where you will find um, Apple, you'll find um, Verizon, you'll find Pfizer, you'll find Mobile Exxon, you'll find Intel, Boeing, Merck, Nike, American Express, McDonald's, you get the idea. Most of these companies you've probably heard of before. Another thing that people will look at is what's known as the S&P 500, which stands for Standard & Poor's 500, which is 500 companies that Standard & Poor's, which is a third party, uh, rate these companies on their profitability. In the S&P, you'll find companies like Discovery, Chipotle, uh, E-Trade, um, Intel, AutoZone, I think Walt Disney is on there too, TripAdvisor, Bank of America, Comcast, Ford. So there are some pretty heavy hitters that trade on the S&P. Now there are a lot of people that speculate that the Dow Jones Industrial Average doesn't really give you a good indicator as to where the market is going or how well the economy is. I personally disagree with that. A lot of economists will say that the S&P 500 is a better indicator than the Dow is. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I still think that the Dow Jones is still a good indicator as far as where the economy is and what these really, really big companies are doing. That's like saying, I want to buy this car. The car looks really good, but the tires on it suck. It's like, yes, the tires are not the only thing that will make or break the car. But if you have this really, really fancy car or a really fast car and crummy tires on it, and the tires being the representation of the Dow Jones, well then, yeah, that again, it's an indicator of how well that particular automobile is going to perform. So I still look into the Dow Jones, but for the sake of simplicity, you can look at the Dow Jones or the S&P and kind of familiarize yourself if something goes up a lot or if something goes down a lot, uh, what that will mean to you. It's not really so much the percent points that matter, but the percentage is what matters. 
So if the Dow Jones, for example, goes down by 300 points, which is kind of a lot, that doesn't really come out to a lot. It comes out to about a little less than 1%. But if the Dow Jones fell 5%, then that would be equivalent to it falling about, I guess, 15 or 1600 points. So it's the percentage that matters, not really so much the points. A spinoff of stocks is it's also helpful to invest in a stock that pays a dividend. I'm sure you've heard the term dividend. Dividend is just a fancy way of saying, here's some money that you get to keep and that we're gonna pay to you quarterly just for keeping the stock. So if you own, let's say, 100 shares of Boeing, and the dividend is 2%. Whatever the stock is worth, let's say it's $100, you are gonna get 2% off of that $100 or $2. So if you own 100 shares, two times 100 is $200. So you are going to get $200 every year. You break that up by quarters, you get $50 a quarter. If you own 1,000 shares, if you own 10,000 shares, 100,000 shares, and so on, uh, you can see that number grows very, very quickly. I personally love stocks that pay dividends because even if a stock is performing poorly, you still get paid that dividend. Most people, most beginners don't know that. You still get paid a dividend regardless if the stock price goes up or down. Now again, not every company that trades on the Dow Jones or on the S&P 500 pay a dividend. As a matter of fact, Amazon, as well as they're doing right now, Amazon does not pay a dividend. Facebook, they don't pay a dividend. Google, one of the largest companies in the world, or Alphabet as they call themselves, does not pay a dividend. So that would be a type of stock that you would hold on to for the long run for the value of it, not necessarily the quarterly payout dividend that it would yield because those companies don't offer it. But those companies that I mentioned are also very expensive too. I think the cheapest out of those would be Facebook, which is probably about $180 a share, effective the end of February 2018. So of course these numbers are subjected to change. This is just the most accurate information that I have available to you at this point. So dividends, are an awesome thing. It's just money that you get for holding on to the stock. So that is stocks 101. You purchase them however many you want, whatever you feel is in your comfort zone, and then you just sit back and just kind of watch it. So those are individual stocks. You are buying stock in one particular company and that company only, and that is it. The next thing that you might want to look at are what are known as ETFs, aka exchange traded funds. These are securities or these are things that you can buy. They are a basket of stocks that are all in the same sector or all in the same industry. So let's say for example, you want to invest in Boeing or Lockheed Martin or Airbus, which are all aero defense uh, companies. But it's too expensive to buy stocks in each individual company by itself. So what do you do? You buy an ETF or an exchange traded fund. An ETF is a basket of stocks that are all in the same industry. There are 11 total industries that these things are classified as such as financials, utilities, consumer staples, energy, that's where you'll find um, a lot of gas companies, or petroleum companies, um, healthcare, that's where you'll find your um, pharmaceutical companies, industrials, companies like 3M, uh, technology, telecom, materials like gold, silver, platinum, copper, real estate, and IT. IT is the big ticket right now. So that's where you're going to find your Google, your Apple, your Microsoft, your Amazon. That's your IT. If you want to buy one particular area of those, that's where you would buy an ETF. So if you bought an ETF for IT, it would have a bunch of different companies that are all in the same arena. And 
you would buy, just like buying a stock, you would buy as many shares as you want of that particular ETF. So let's say, for example, you want to buy a financial ETF. If you think the financial world is going to increase, if you think banks are going to do well, and you want to buy a little bit of like JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, um, Chase Manhattan, uh, what are the other ones? Goldman Sachs, Blackstone. You would buy an ETF based off of that so that way you can kind of wet your beak for financials. So that is what an ETF is. The only little drawback with ETF is that you have to pay a little bit of a fee on it, unlike stocks where you just pay to get in and you pay to get out. The Again, that's where that $5 fee comes in. With an ETF, the fees are a little lower than that of a mutual fund, which I'll get into in a second. But ETFs are good if you wanna stay in one sector of the market. The next thing, or really the last thing rather, again, I'm trying to keep this simple for you, is um, mutual funds. Mutual funds are a little bit of a spinoff of a ETF. A mutual fund is just a basket of stocks that is picked by a manager. And odds are, the companies that are in there, sometimes it could be 10, it could be 12, it could be 20, and they all constitute different percentages. And there's a fee associated with that. And the fee is a little higher than that of a ETF because you gotta pay the manager to basically collect all the information and manage it. Now we're not talking earth shattering money here, we're talking about maybe no more than 1% of whatever the mutual fund is worth. but. Again, it's a good way to kind of wet your beak and get into the market and watch your money grow as the market increases in value. Now, like I said earlier, a lot of people would come to me and ask me for some very basic investment advice. And whenever I would be explaining these things to people, we would always be out to dinner for whatever reason. It would always come up when we would go out to eat. And the analogy I always use when people are afraid to make that leap forward into investing in something that they're not going to see an immediate return on their investment on is I point to the glass that I'm drinking out of. And I say, you see this glass right here? You don't own this glass. So when a waiter or waitress comes by to take it, you really don't care what the hell happens to it. You don't care if she drops it. You don't care if it's cleaned properly. You don't care where it goes because it's not yours. So now back up a second. Let's say you did own that glass and that glass was yours and the waiter or waitress came by to pick it up. You better believe that you would be eyeing that person down as they were taking it back into the kitchen to make sure that it was cleaned properly and put in its proper place. My point is, I know it seems scary to invest in something that you're not really physically going to see or something that you're not going to see an increase in in a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years. My advice to you is just do it. Whatever you can comfortably afford to put in and let sit, do that. I am not saying that you should be investing your life savings. I'm not saying you should invest your paycheck every week. I'm not saying to be reckless, but by having money in there, that is going to be your little baby. You are going to watch it, you're gonna monitor it, and you're gonna do everything you possibly can to make sure that your investment is protected. So that's why I'm doing this podcast at a very basic level because I want people to get over the fear that you don't have to be Gordon Gecko or Warren Buffett to be investing in the stock market. It is something that's actually very easy to do. Again, I was self-taught. I never majored in finance. I don't have a financial background. So anything that I tell you here today, I, please take with a grain of salt. This is just my personal experience that I have had with it, and I've had a tremendous amount of success with it over the years and even in the past couple months. So if there's something that I want you to take away from this podcast is that it is not a scary thing. It is not a complicated thing. These companies that I mentioned, these online brokerage accounts, they're there to help you. If you have any questions, there's always a 1-800 number. If you have any doubt before you do something, 
give them a call. You might want to ask people that are already invested in the stock market, whether it's bonds, whether it's their retirement funds, whether it's stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, the stuff that I mentioned earlier in this podcast. Talk to them and get their input on it, but just know it's not a scary thing. I read a statistic somewhere where it's something like over 60% of people are intimidated by the investment process because they're unfamiliar with it. And they're afraid to take that little leap of faith, but you leap forward, the net will catch you. And do not be discouraged that if you purchase something and it immediately goes down the next day or the next week or the next month, okay? Nothing in the stock market is guaranteed, which is why it is not FDIC insured. So you always are investing at your own risk. It's also important to note that there is no cookie cutter approach or a set way to properly invest. The best way to invest is a strategy that works for you. So what works for you might not work for the person sitting next to you or might not work for your neighbor. Everybody's financial situation is different. Everybody's risk tolerance is different. Everybody's involvement or opinion will always vary. But what's important is that you do what makes you comfortable. If you're comfortable just buying one or two things and just letting it grow over the course of time, more power to you. That's actually how I got started. If you want to attack it a little more aggressively where you are uh, buying and selling on a monthly or bi-monthly or even a weekly basis, again, more power to you. Just please make sure that you um, are aware of the risk factors in doing so. Another thing I forgot to mention is that um, when you purchase a when you purchase a stock, going back to the beginning of the show, when you purchase a stock and you want to be taxed at a lower tax rate, hold on to the stock for at least a year. The magic number is 366 days. And the reason I mention that is because if you sell a stock less than a year, 365 or less days, you are taxed at what is called short-term capital gains tax. I believe that is 25%. If you wait a year or more, you are taxed at 15% or less. There have been occasions where that number was lower depending on whatever your income bracket is. Obviously, the higher your income bracket is, the more you're going to be taxed. But if you fall in that sweet spot of the 15% or less tax bracket, you will pay lower taxes or even no taxes on securities that you sell or dividends that you receive. So I just want to make that uh, clear. Um, I apologize. I should have said that um, earlier. But if you're starting out, odds are you're probably not going to be trading as aggressively at first until you're familiar with what things are, what causes things to go up, what causes things to go down, and then you'll start to realize, okay, uh, this company just cut a deal with that company, so that might be worth looking into. So do your research. The, um, the app that I use to kind of monitor and research a particular stock is Yahoo Finance. It's like the easiest thing in the world to do. I have it on my phone, I have it on my iPad. Uh, there are certain stocks that I don't even own that I can just watch or I can monitor it for however long I want. And if I see it dip a little bit, then you know I might be inclined to buy some. And if it goes up, I just kind of sit back and just watch it go up. That's it. Just don't be afraid. It's not that scary. I went over the basics with you. If you have to listen to this podcast again, or just Google Investing 101 and it'll kind of rehash some of the jargon that I used here today. As you can tell, it's really not that scary. It's really not that complicated, but it's important that you know your risk tolerance and you want to invest in a strategy that works for you. So if somebody says they have the be all end all of uh, marketing strategies, like, oh, you got to buy this or you got to do that. No, don't listen to them. I can't tell you how many times I've personally have been burned off of a 
quote stock tip or a hot tip that someone had. And I want to say about 70% of the time that particular thing that I bought ended up tanking. It was the items, it was the stocks, it was the ETFs that I bought off of my own intuition and my own gut and my own instinct is what is performing well today. I own stocks that have yielded over 40%. I have stocks that have lost over 20%. So yes, sometimes it sucks and sometimes it's great and you're going to encounter a roller coaster of emotions as volatility in the market um, starts to come back. But just stick with it. Don't give up. Don't get frustrated. Don't say this isn't for me because if it was so easy, everybody would be doing it. Odds are you're not going to be a multimillionaire overnight or by next week. But again, it's important to note that you just stay with it, have confidence, and just know that whatever it is that you bought is going to endure the test of time. And you will thank yourself and hopefully me in the long run that you were able to kind of leap out ahead and put your money to work rather than doing your nine to five or collecting interest on a savings account or just having it stuffed onto your mattress because it's not really doing you any good there. So even if things seem like they're bad or they're down and you're relatively young, don't worry about it. If you see uh, the market dip or if you see a recession that may or may not come, don't worry about it. A lot of people like to sell in a panic. Don't do it. If you're young enough, you will outlive any recession or any depression that comes through. And eventually, like I said, over time, these things will bounce back. So you really have nothing to worry about. But again, take everything what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I'm sure you're going to do your own research. Find a brokerage company that works for you. Find a stock that works for you. If you want to even invest in something that you uh, that you use so you can familiarize yourself with the company, go for it. Just do your, re do your research. Don't look too, too deep into it because odds are you'll probably scare yourself as I have done. There have been countless number of times I have told myself do not buy something and it ended up skyrocketing or I convinced myself to buy something and then lo and behold, it ended up tanking. All these feelings are totally normal. And for the love of God, do not kick yourself for not buying something when you should because my financial investor always told me that the market will always give you a second chance. So if you don't get it this time around, odds are you'll probably get it next time around at a price or at a time in your life that would be better for you. And that's it. That's the podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening to the Victory Loves Company podcast. I'm Conrad Agdarian. Please check us out on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter handles at VLC Podcast. Or if you have any suggestions or questions for myself, you can always email us at the victory podcast at gmail.com and i'll talk to you next week